Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast, where the more we know, the more we want to find out, tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And tonight, we're going to talk about the concept of race, in particular in reference to the ancient world and medieval England. Mm-hmm. <laughs> A lighthearted topic. (laughs) So we'll come back to why we've chosen to talk about that tonight, uh, but I have a couple of things to cover first. We had a fair amount of discussion after our last episode about favourite Hercules movies. Fair number of tweets and other responses. Unsurprisingly, the consensus appears to be whatever one you saw first. (laughs) Whether that was the Reeves movies and some people who'd seen that when they were kids thought that was the best movie and really set the template, which of course it did. Uh, Many people who loved the Hercules cartoon, the Disney, uh, not, sorry, not the horrible cartoon, but the (laughs) Disney film. (laughs) But surely we love the horrible cartoon. That's our first, isn't it? No? I have a very fond spot for, I mean, that's the only reason we keep bringing it up. It's an awful, awful (laughs) creation. Um, People definitely seem to gravitate towards the one they'd seen first, but no one claimed the Schwarzenegger version as their favorite. Maybe not very many people saw it. I think that's probably a part of it anyway. (laughs) So anyway, just thank you for uh, everybody who chimed in about that. That was interesting to hear some feedback on that. Also, I wanted to remind everyone about Two Pods a Day, which is an event that is taking place in October. And it's something we're taking part in. It's a campaign that aims to introduce podcast listeners to two independent podcasts every day. And it hopes to give visibility to some of the great indie podcasts in particular that you probably haven't heard of. So if you want to listen more and listen indie, as their catchphrase goes, why don't you check out the hashtag two pods a day? That's the letter two pods a day on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and find some new and amazing work being done by independent podcasters. All right. And then cocktails. <laughs> So we did consider very briefly trying to find a race-themed cocktail. (laughs) Decided that was not a good idea. No, hopefully there aren't any. And if there are any, we certainly don't want to drink them. (laughs) So in the end, I went with making up something on a blood theme, specifically with blood orange bitters, which we have a container of. And so I just made a essentially a blood orange martini sweet martini, vodka, blood orange bitters, and triple sec. Mm -hmm. And my thinking was simply that we are going to be talking about blood, if only metaphorically, or kinship Mm -hmm. in this discussion. And so a cocktail that was centered on blood, but metaphorically, was as close as I was going to (laughs) get. So let's try it. All right. Orangey? Yeah, bitter enough for you. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, something that leaves a bitter taste in our mouth is also appropriate to a discussion of race. (laughs) But it's perfectly nice. Yeah. 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 Very orangey. Very kind of refreshing, too. Okay. So let's explain why we're going to talk about this tonight. There's a larger conversation to be had and that needs to be had in both of our disciplines. And that is being had. That is absolutely being had, at least by some people, Mm -hmm. about a set of linked issues the concept of race in our disciplines, that is, in the periods that our disciplines cover, race within our disciplines themselves, that is, in academia and the universities and departments Mm -hmm. that study these areas, that is, how those departments think about race, but also the race of the people in those departments Mm -hmm. and how race is treated and how open, inclusive, exclusive, etc., those departments are. And then... The thing that has really brought this to the fore is a more recent highlighting of the ways that modern discussions about race have a tendency to, or at least some people involved in those discussions, have a tendency to reach back to the ancient world or to the medieval world, in particular to medieval England, to justify or prove or in some other way speak to points that are being made, I would argue, tendentiously most of the time, but anyway, points that are being made about race in the modern world. Yeah. Those three issues are very closely connected, but they are also distinct. 
we're not going to try to cover all of that tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's an enormous discussion, an enormous issue. Mm -hmm. um, each one of those three is... is uh, enormous in itself. Enormous in itself. Not to mention that we're talking about two linked but different mm -hmm. disciplines and periods, the ancient world and the medieval world. However, recent events, reasonably recent events, both politically in the wider world, in the U.S. and, and around the world, not just in the U.S., but certainly highlighted by things like in Charlottesville and mm -hmm. other um, explosions in the U.S., have brought some of these issues really far to the fore in mm -hmm. a way that they have not necessarily been dealt with recently. So that's one reason we want to talk about it now. There's also been some events in both of our disciplines mm -hmm. to do with individual people that have really brought to the fore the problems within the academy. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do tonight is actually not address any of those, <laughs> but to lay the groundwork for doing so. In the long run, in a few episodes from now, we are hoping to, and we are in the course of preparing to, produce an episode that will be a little different than our regular type. Uh, rather than being an interview with one person or just the two of us talking, it will be a, we're going to do a, a number of interviews with a number of people who have been working on and involved in and affected by these issues in both of our disciplines. And we'll try to put those together into a way of talking about and thinking about what's going on and what might be done about it. Mm -hmm. In order to get there, though, we think we need to do some background. Yeah. So we'll talk about some basic terminology. Mm-hmm and some basic concepts mm -hmm. of race in the medieval and ancient world. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So tonight what we're going to do is, to some extent anyway, avoid the modern issues, except so far as we talk about how modern scholarship has dealt with these issues. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be, even so, we're not going to be comprehensive. The question of race and ethnicity and attitudes towards those things in Greece, Rome, and medieval England, that's a huge topic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely massive. So we're not going to be able to cover everything. But what we thought we'd do is go over some basic vocabulary, talk about the categories as they existed, as best as we can have an understanding of them, and kind of lay the groundwork so that when we give our uh, interviews later on with people and, and they can discuss the problems that are current in the fields, you'll understand what the terminology is, what the issues are. We won't have to sort of stop and explain everything along the way. And to clarify, I'll be specifically addressing uh, Anglo-Saxon England. Yes, when I say not, medieval England. Not later yeah. medieval England. Which has um, its own set of which, issues. Yeah, its own set of issues, its own set of terminology. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave that aside and just focus on the Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. And as is our way, we're going at it through language and etymology and terminology. So that's what we're going to focus on. Because the other thing is, these issues, yes, have been raised recently, and there's some really troubling issues about them, but it's actually quite a fascinating topic yeah. in and of itself. The question of how did the ancient and Anglo-Saxon worlds think about how humans are categorized is an interesting question that is completely on a par with the other kinds of questions we ask on this podcast. Mm -hmm. So enough preamble. I realize that was quite a lot of introduction, but let us turn then to this and with the caveat that we will be coming back to the topic, not immediately, not in the next couple of episodes, but hopefully before Christmas, I think we will get yep. to it, I hope. And we will have lots of other people who have thought very deeply about this, much more so than either of us has, mm -hmm. to tell you about their experiences with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's start with the most basic of basics. What does the word race mean, Mark? Well, this is, <laughs> so this is a late word. Right. It should be pointed out. It's It comes to English well after the Anglo-Saxon period. Mm -hmm. And it's a puzzle word as well, because we don't really know where it's from. There's There are theories, mm -hmm. none of which are universally accepted. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that describes an awful lot of scholarship, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so it comes through, through French. That's the sort of direct line of entry into, into English. Into English, right. Um, unsurprisingly, and before that, Italian. So Italian raza, R-A-Z-Z-A. -Z -Z -A. Oh, okay. Hmm. That is all we know for sure. So... <laughs> <laughs> Quick, play the theme music. We're done. Now, in terms of the the sense that it had, it so it comes into the language... Into English? Into English in the ooh, 
16th century, mm -hmm. originally referring to non-humans. Okay. So things like wines with a characteristic flavor, groups of people with common occupation, okay, things like that. You don't get the the sense of people regarded as at, regarded as of a common stock mm -hmm. in that sense until later in the 16th century. Okay. So um, originally it means a group with a commonality. Yes, a group of anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not, not necessarily people. And the sort of modern sense of the sort of divisions of humankind based on physical peculiarities doesn't come about until the 18th century. Right. So that's quite late. Mm -hmm. And there's a very obvious triggering event for that, right? Yes. It's this African the slave, slave trade. trade. Yeah. yeah. That's what's going on in the 18th century that makes this a term. That suddenly everybody is, wants to have. Yeah. They want to spend their time categorizing people by physical characteristics so that they can rank them and consider some people more human than others and all sorts mm -hmm. of things like that. Right. Now, as to the general guesses as to <laughs> where it might come from, one suggestion is that it comes from Latin ratio. Meaning reason or measurement? Yeah. Okay. Or that it is a shortening of generatio. So then it would have to do with birth. Birth, yeah. All right. It's probably not from radix. Root. Root. Okay. But it may have been influenced by that word. Yeah, so that sort of convergent evolution that words yeah. sometimes have. Right. Yeah. And again, that's, that's, that's as those far are as guesses, we can go. and yeah. that's as far as we can go. Right. So it's a word that kind of comes out of nowhere and dances around for a while before it settles on its current, current. or something close to its current meaning. Yeah. So as a word meaning what it means now, it doesn't occur until there is a need to differentiate humans yeah. in a way that is helpful to one group of them. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's race. Now, what does race mean now? It means a group of people characterized by certain physical characteristics who also have a geographic origin in common. Would you say that's a... I suppose. Um, a geographic origin at some point in their past yeah. in common. I think one of the problems with defining this word is, in a, any kind of technical sense, mm -hmm. is that there simply is no agreement amongst, say, anthropologists oh, as yeah. to what the term means. Yeah, it's, uh, maybe we should just say this right off the top. The word race in any scientific sense, is essentially completely debunked mm -hmm. at this point. It was created in the 18th century as a scientific term, right? Mm -hmm. Like as a way of trying to do something that was objective and scientific in terms of making measurements and distinctions between humans and has been since pretty much the 20th century in terms of science, mm -hmm. certainly since the mid-20th century. Anthropologists, scientists, biologists... Anyone who has anything to do with objective measurements of humans has said no racial categories make any sense. They're simply constructed. Yeah, you can divide up the world of humans in lots of ways. And if you decide that there's a set of criteria you're going to use, you can do it. But the variations within any given race mm -hmm. are greater than the, vari the variations between races. And in fact, there has never been an accepted definition of race. Right. So... It's not even that it was a formulated idea that was then debunked. It was an idea that had been argued about left since and its right, inception. right since its inception with no clear right. sense of what it means and has been largely abandoned. Right. So it exists in a social setting mm -hmm. and in political settings to some degree. And over the last... 50 to 100 years. You know, skin color is what most people tend to think of when they mean race, but religion has become a big determiner of what race somebody counts as in the last 20 years, at least, if not long before. Well, that's, as we'll get to, yeah. that's certainly the... It goes back in and out. In yeah, it goes in and out depending on what... Um, we don't need to get into all the details of, you know, when whiteness as a race or blackness as a race were categorized, though... Spoiler alert, it was the 18th century as well, essentially, and later. But the important point is to say there's no objective definition of race. And why that's important 
without getting into all of the many complicated discussions about the modern conception, is that there are many words in Latin, Greek, and Anglo-Saxon that have been defined in dictionaries with, among other words, the word race. Right. And that's why it was, I think, necessary to talk about the Eng- the English word race, mm-hmm. because... If you take too unthinking a way of thinking about dictionaries, you can be like, oh, well, this word means race, because that's how it's defined in a dictionary. But what's important to realize is that when a dictionary uses the word race to define a Latin word, given that we don't have a good definition of the English word race, you should immediately pause and think, wait, what element of this really murky English word does the Latin word have to do with? Mm-hmm. So we're going to talk about a number of words, all of which have been defined in dictionaries with the word race, as well as other words, or many of which have been. But that, you know, that's just not a satisfactory definition because it, it sort of becomes circular. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then let's start with Greek. The two main words that are often defined in the dictionary with the word race are genos and ethnos. So do you want to tell us the derivation of those words? Sure. So genos, this is one of these roots that actually gives us a number of the words we're going to be talking about mm-hmm. today. Genos goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root, yeah. gene or mm-hmm. gena, mm-hmm. that is a very productive root, an extremely right. productive root. And it has a lot of different words that aren't necessarily relevant to our discussion today. Right. But there are a handful of words that are very relevant to our discussion today. So there's obviously a Latin reflex of this. Mm-hmm. Gens, um, which gens, we will talk about. Yeah, soon. gens and genus. Mm-hmm. Two, two versions two of the same root. Versions word, yeah. of the same basic root. Also, natio, mm-hmm. which we'll be talking about, comes from this same root. The gn, basically. The gne, gne yeah. root. Yeah, so natio you should be, used to be gnatio mm-hmm. um, in old Latin, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or you can still see that in... Proto, Proto-Italic. You or, can still see that in uh, various... Or mm-hmm. nascor, actually, is nascor. the verb, mm-hmm. means to be born. Right. And cognatus is people who are born along with you. Right. And then the G is still there in cognatus. Gnatus, yeah. It also appears in the Germanic line as kin, mm, mm-hmm. as in your kith and kin. Mm-hmm. Bit of an old-fashioned word now, I guess. Yeah, but I think most people know but probably it. Probably most people know kinship. it. Kinship. You kinship. know the word kinship. Yeah. And so that word kin, though, is a really important one in Old English. Right. Yeah. So this comes from a birth. So the basic the sense basic of sense it is, is that birth. birth. Yeah. yeah. To, so th- that gena root um, at proto uh, Indo-European root means to to give birth, to beget. Right. And then ethnos or ethnos. wethnos as it was probably before it had a uh, digamma at the beginning, which uh-huh. dropped out in classical Greek. Which obviously we get ethnic from. In, yes. You know, oh, yeah. No, there's an ethnography. And... So this is, this is kind of an interesting one. It comes from basically a, a pronoun. Right. Yes. Okay. Se or sue mm-hmm. or sua, mm-hmm. sui. Which is the reflexive the third reflexive, person pronoun. Yeah. Gives us se in French. Se in French, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Il se lave. And so it has a whole bunch of derivatives that have to do with the self. Right. Okay. Including the word self. The the basic idea is a group referring to itself as an entity. We ourselves. The us and the us, the us and them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. In addition to I mean, I can list off you know, many derivatives from this, Mm -hmm. but in particular, it might be worth noting words like select, separate, segregate, those, that, that sort of batch of words from Latin. All of which have to do with choosing and making distinctions. Mm -hmm. Ethnic ethos Mm -hmm. from the Greek side. Mm Mm-hmm. No, well, self is the, is the particular Germanic, I guess, derivative of that. Right. Okay. So those are your Greek terms. So genos means people who have a birth in common Mm -hmm. in a really broad way, some kind of ancestral link. Ethnos is translated in the dictionary as number of people living together, a company, a body of men, a body of people. It's an old dictionary. So they say body of men. Right. And genos is translated as race, stock, or kin. Okay? Okay. Now... That makes it sound now, of course, those are only the primary definitions, and then there's a number of multiple secondary and extended definitions. That makes it sound like they're similar but fairly easily distinguishable. 
a group of men versus a race or a kinship group. But as I said, whenever you see race as a definition, you should perk your ears up and say, okay, what does this actually mean? Because that's a problematic term. So ethnos, it could mean any group, going back to what you were talking about, the original meaning of race. Right. Any group distinguished by a commonality. Mm -hmm. So it was used, for instance, in Homeric poems and in early classical poetry, ethnos was used as a collective noun and ethne was a group or a crowd or a herd. So it could mean like a swarm of bees or a flock of birds or an ethne laon was a group of men, mm -hmm. but Clearly, ethne in that sense just meant a group okay. who was in some way connected. Now, as we move forward into the classical period, ethne or ethnos in prose, so it, in poetry, in early poetry, means a sort of community of identifiable elements, something that can be identified as a group. In the classical period, you have it starting to mean racially unitary human groups, says my article that I'm looking at. Okay. But... We should already be worrying about what does racially unitary human group mean uh -huh. when we know that there's no easy way of defining what is a racially unitary group. But nonetheless, perception is what we're talking about here rather than scientific uh -huh. truth. So ethnos does come to mean sort of a group of humans who have some racial or ethnic group together. But you also have this pairing. So you get an ethnos and the polis as on the one hand. Right. The polis, of course, is the city, yep. the city-state. And then on the other hand, ethnos and genos, paired. Mm -hmm. So the former refers to like within a polis, within a city, what is your ethnos? What is the group within the city that you are a part of? Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of divisions within the citizen body, right, that you're going to be part of or not part of. Mm -hmm. Ethnos and genos, on the other hand, outside of the city, refers more to sort of regional and racial associations. So you could have an ethnos and a genos uh, talking about different groups regionally around the Mediterranean, different people who live in different places. Mm -hmm. And ethnos becomes more and more used of regional distinctions. So when my article talks about racially distinctive groups, what they really mean is regionally distinctive groups. So you talk about the Persians or the Egyptians or the Phoenicians or the Carthaginians or the Spanish or the Gauls as being ethne. Okay. Right? And yes, one could probably try to draw up a line of physical characteristics that determine them, but really they're being referred to by their regional groups. Right. And of course, while movement is certainly a feature of the ancient world, to some extent, you know, ethnic and regional and racial characteristics line up mm -hmm. more easily in the ancient world than they do in the modern world. Mm -hmm. So you get this use of it to mean regional distinctions. So ethnos is not impossible to equate to sort of modern definitions of race, but it doesn't at all need to mean that. And when you talk about the ethnos within a polis, you're definitely not talking about racial distinctions. If you're talking about different ethne within Athens, you're talking about different family groups. Right. That's not at all the same thing. Genos, on the other hand, within the polis and outside of it is often used to mean a family unit, people who share a birth ancestor, uh, sometimes stretching back to a specific ancestor or founder, often in a mythological sense, so people who sort of share a genos. Mm -hmm. But that also can overlap with regional things because any city that claims a mythical founder will claim, therefore, that they are all of the genos of Cadmus in Thebes, for instance, or the genos of um, Erechtheon in Athens, who's a founder but a born from the soil. But anyway, you know, the, the people who founded their cities. Right. So genos sort of is a family unit. And the ethnic label, the ethnos, as we move forward past classical Greek into Hellenistic Greek, also can end up meaning like political units. So you have regional units, and that can extend to political units. So that ethnic label, the label that says what ethnos you're part of, so mm -hmm. the sort of adjectival form right. that refers to your ethnos, can be a city or a region or a river or an island or even a political grouping like the Aetolian League in the Hellenistic period. A political group of cities that just exist as a political group and only a political group. It doesn't have any particular ties of kinship. Right. So these are your two sort of central terms in Greek. And I'm going to get back to, I'll talk more after we've talked about words about sort of conceptions of mm -hmm. what we might think of as race in the ancient world. 
But we can already see they don't have a good word for mapping onto the Venn diagram of what race covers. Right. There's no one word that easily and clearly means a set of distinguishable physical characteristics that are relevant to the place that you came from Mm -hmm. and also affect your moral and intellectual capacity. Mm -hmm. All right, on to Latin. In Latin, we have natio, gens, and I suppose populus as well. Yeah. I mean, we've already covered gens. It comes more directly in Latin from gigno, which means to be born. Mm Mm-hmm. And the translation in the Oxford Latin Dictionary is a race, nation, people. But probably the term, the sense in which it comes up the most often is actually sense six in OLD. So maybe it's not the most often. It's the one I think of the most, though, which is a Roman clan or group of families sharing the same nomen and the same supposed ancestor. First only patrician, but later, later spreading to the plebeians. So your gens is what sort of clan or family group, large family group, you belong to right. in the Roman world. And it's an important sort of identifier and way of its political groupings often happen, especially in the Republic and early empire when people still have strong family groupings like that. So it really is about birth. So when it's used like that, it's about, again, nothing that could be in any way considered racial because we're talking about different family groups within the very small group of native romans right then you have natio connected to nascord yeah to give birth to again defined as a people race nation so gens was a race nation people Mm -hmm. (laughs) natio is a people race nation Mm -hmm. (laughs) so natio can also be since four they give as race as a characteristic of persons or nationality okay so we'll come back to that and then populus which apparently is Etruscan, potentially, in origin? Well, th- That's so what OLD this is another, said. This, yeah. th- so this is another unknown. It might be Etruscan or non-Indo-European. Yeah. But one suggestion for uh, an Indo-European root mm-hmm. is that it might come from Pella, which means to fill, to pile up. We get the word fill from that, as well as the word folk, folk. 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 (laughs) You were trying to be really etymological about that. Yes. Folk. Folk. People don't use... They don't pronounce the L. do not pronounce the L. Folk. Folk. Yeah. So full, fill. Okay. It might be from that, and it it might also be related, therefore, to pleb, plebeian. Right. Okay. Which might be the people, which certainly are the people. Yeah. Yeah. So populace, of course, just means... um, well, the definition here is a human community, people, or nation. Yeah. Most famously in the populus senatus qua Romani, mm-hmm. the people. And the, so it means, in common Roman po- parlance, it means the bulk of the population. Mm-hmm. And of course, it gives us all those words. It gives us population and people and popular and all of those kinds of words. But it also is certainly used by Romans when they're talking about groups of people outside of the Roman world. Yeah a populus, a, you know, the various populi outside of the Roman world. So it certainly can be used that way. That way. But again, I would say populus has a very strong overlap with political unit, units. Okay. Not necessarily political units in the sense of like an actual ruled group, but in the sense of um, a civic identity or what we might now call a nation state identity. Mm-hmm. That's anachronistic for the Roman period, but nonetheless, a group that sort of has a commonality of laws and views about how the world should work. So when the world is divided into populi, right. it tends to go along with sort of kings of different regions. And so it, yes, lines up with ethnicities and what we might call race to some degree, but you might break many people who we would think of as the same race into many populi because of their political, political divisions. Right or military divisions Mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call it. So those are your words. They can all be used and they are all used to refer to groups outside of the Roman world as well as groups within the Roman world. We have a lot of ethnographers from both Greek and Roman sources who like to talk about non-Romans or non-Greeks and discuss their salient characteristics, the things that set them apart from the Romans or from the Greeks, 
things that set them apart from each other, the weirdnesses of them. And those include physical characteristics as well as what we might call cultural characteristics, what they do, how they have sex, what they eat, where they sleep, elements of their laws, elements of their wars, whatever. We have all that. We have lots of, you know, that was a fascinating topic to the ancient world. They loved to write about that. So if we want to turn to the sort of concepts of race in the ancient world, we have, on the one hand, lots of sources, lots of evidence for it. But as soon as you start looking closely at those sources, trying to make them line up with what we consider to be pertinent divisions becomes really complicated. So Herodotus has, spends a lot of, technically he's writing a history of the Persian Wars. You'd think he'd spend a lot of time writing about the Persian Wars, but he has, he spends a lot of time not writing about the Persian Wars at all. And in particular, he spends a lot of time talking about Egypt. Okay but also about Persia and also about all sorts of other non-Greek parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And he's just interested in what we would call ethnography. But in doing so, he focuses mostly on how they act. Mm -hmm. He does talk about what they look like to some degree, but mostly he focuses on like, how many people do they marry? What are their marriage customs? How do they have sex and where? In the case of the Egyptians, where do they urinate? (laughs) What do they eat? What are their uh, salient political characteristics? What kinds of leaders do they have? How do they elect them? How do they fight? What weapons do they use? Among all of those things, he'll often mention things like what their hair color or eye color or skin color or shape of their heads or particular physical peculiarities are. Mm -hmm. But they're very much all of a piece with all the other things that distinguish them and their language sometimes. And (laughs) some of them are extremely extravagant. Some of them seem to be possibly true. Many of them seem to be quite likely to be completely bizarre, if not made up by Herodotus, made up by the people who told Herodotus about the stories. So we don't see him categorizing the world according, in in particular, you know, to get right down to it, he, he does not categorize the world by skin color. Right. He remarks upon the skin color of some people, but not everyone. Many of the groups he talks about, he doesn't say anything about the skin color. And he doesn't seem to think that that is the preeminent division Mm -hmm. among them. So while you can look at it and say he's talking about racial categories, in order to do so, you have to count language, tribal relations, marriage customs, and food as racial characteristics. Mm. And while some people may do so, That is not usually what the sort of standard conception of race is. Mm -hmm. And he also, like many Greeks did, viewed the physical characteristics of people as being a result of the geography. So where they lived affected what they looked like. So he, like many Greeks, believed that what he called Ethiopians, who were dark-skinned, were dark-skinned because they lived in these very far south sunny regions where they were burned. Their skin was burned. But there's a very clear confusion in his mind, and this is actually addressed by later medical texts, that when people who have the skin color move out of those regions, they do not lose the skin color. So if it's caused by environmental conditions, why does it not change when they go to other places? And why, when Greeks go there, do they not become that color? And this is an unresolved question. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a sort of clash of what the ideology about how these things work is, with observed reality. Mm -hmm. And that comes up in some of our later texts. But in the basic sort of principle is that where you live affects what you look like, Mm -hmm. which means in theory, it's not a fixed racial characteristic. Mm -hmm. It's a reaction to your environment. And if you were to move to another environment, you would have a different racial characteristic. So it, it can't really be considered race in that sense because it's simply a reaction to environment. Right. And they don't have a fully developed genetic... Right. Understanding, of course. (laughs) Understandably. Okay. So that's sort of Herodotus. Um, You've got very similar kinds of things going on with the Romans. I could talk, I mean, this is an almost inexhaustible Mm -hmm. question. One thing I can say is the Greeks certainly did have strong xenophobia. (laughs) That is, you know, Mm -hmm. to them, what mattered was whether you were Greek or you were not Greek. And Everyone who was not Greek was, by definition, lesser. So right. they were very Helleno-supremist, mm-hmm. you know. But it didn't 
it's hard to say that that was in any way a skin color issue because they were definitely better than all those Ethiopians, but they were definitely better than all the Gauls who had this really weird white skin and pale hair. They were better than Persians who were light skinned. They were better, you know, they were better than everybody who wasn't Greek. Right. And many of the people who they were better than were not notably distinct from them in color Mm -hmm. or other physical characteristics. What was important to them was whether you spoke Greek, worshipped Greek gods, had general Greek customs. Mm -hmm. So we have the basic distinction between Hellens, Hellenes, and barbarians. Right. Right. Then the other thing that really mattered was what city you were from. So an Athenian hated a Spartan or at least considered themselves different from a Spartan. But again, we can't call that race in any modern conception of race because what distinguishes an Athenian from a Spartan physically? What distinguishes a Theban from a Corinthian? Nothing. I mean, I'm sure each of those cities came up with things that were particular to their cities and their groups. And there was enough inbreeding that there may have been distinctive, you know, nose shapes or something. But basically, they're all very, very similar. And there was, in fact, lots of intermarriage and things like that. So if they were racial purists, which in some ways they were, they were so on grounds that had nothing to do with the sort of physical characteristics that we often think of race Mm -hmm. as meaning. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you turn to the Romans, very briefly, the Romans were filled with prejudice against people within the Roman Empire, outside of the Roman Empire. They loved to make categorizations about the world and to distinguish people as being better and worse. But the grounds on which they did so were, again, like the Greeks, just not skin color, specifically. Mm -hmm. They were to do with where you were from, so Spaniards or people from Gaul or people from uh, outside of Rome or people from North Africa or people from Britain or people from Greece. Oh, the Romans thought the Greeks were horrible. I mean, they were intensely prejudiced against Greeks for instance, Mm. but not specifically about color. And again, it has to do more with how well they spoke Latin, what their customs were, whether they wore pants or togas, whether they had long they had been citizens of Rome, uh, what their fighting styles were, you know, how well they were educated, all those things. Grounds for intense prejudice, bigotry and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Not in any way trying to suggest the Romans and the Greeks were not intensely bigoted, (laughs) because they certainly could be. But the grounds on which they determined who was in and who were out just were different. Right. And the last thing I want to say on that topic before I turn us over to the Anglo-Saxon period, which I know is that you're going to talk about Latin words too. Yeah. There's one specific issue, which is the question of white and black skin that comes up when we talk about the ancient world in particular. Because, of course, both Greeks and Romans encountered large numbers of people who had different variations of color to their skin, different skin pigmentations. And there's been a lot of discussion about this, and I don't want to recapitulate it all. There is, to some degree, a kind of tripartite division for both Greeks and Romans, about the world that is based really on Aristotelian notions of the mean, the perfect medium. Right. That there are extremes, and then there's the the place in between that is ideal. Mm -hmm. And by that kind of reasoning, you have very dark people and very light people and a perfect medium in between. And... It will not surprise you that the Greeks believed themselves to be the perfect medium in between and that the Romans believed themselves to be the perfect medium in between. Right. And both groups looked to the black peoples that they encountered in Africa as being one end of the spectrum and white peoples they considered to be the Germanic and Celtic peoples who had mm. very, very pale skins as being the other end of the spectrum, both of whom were clearly, because of their geography changed in their physical characteristics to be extreme, Mm -hmm. burned or frozen. But only those who lived in the perfect zone of the world, the Mediterranean zone, had the perfect complexion. And that was Roman and Greek. And we can see that hinted at, but in fact, it's not really theorized extensively in very many of our source texts. We can see that there is certainly a 
we talked about this when we talked about color. White was certainly a, a good color in mm -hmm. most contexts. Mm -hmm. Black was often a negative connotation. So those connotations certainly did exist in the ancient world. They could be applied to people, and we do have s cases when they are applied to people. But it wasn't universal or obvious or commonplace. It was a thing that could happen, but was not automatic. Right. So lots of groups of people who, when you look at the context, must have been dark-skinned are referenced with no reference to their skin color. It just isn't mentioned. So it's clearly not a salient point. And in fact, what we see is that white or white-armed is used to refer in Homer to women and goddesses. And black or black-skinned refers to Odysseus and Heracles as being active male figures who are sort of sunburned. You know, the idea here is that there's a distinction between how what you do, and it's a gender distinction more than it is anything else. So we just don't see um, that development of a concept of a people as white or black as a group, and that being a defining characteristic it is not a major feature. Let us say, I'm not saying it's unknown or impossible to conceptualize for the Greeks or the Romans, and probably the Romans more than the Greeks, but it's just not, it's one of many possible sets of characters, characterizations. Right. Okay. And of course, important to all of this is that the distinction between free and slave or citizen and non-citizen, Greek, barbarian, Roman, and non-Roman, always the most important distinction. And just in case it's not clear, slaves in the ancient world were, <laughs> as one person puts it, open to all comers. Anyone could be a slave. So while there was a bit of a prejudice in the Greeks against having Greeks as slaves, Anyone could be a slave and anyone could, especially in the Roman world, then become a non-slave. So there simply was no ethnic category that went along with being slaves. Right. There were prejudices against slaves and ex-slaves, for sure, but they could not be lumped into one geographical group because they simply came from too many places. Okay. Even though I talked for a long time there, it was still simplifying a lot of things, <laughs> but <laughs> I think that gives a sort of background. Why don't we move on to then Anglo-Saxon words? Okay. Well, I mean, in fact, the most important words to understanding what's going on in uh, Anglo-Saxon England are Latin words. Because of the sources you because have. Because of the sources. So the really, the most important source for understanding the Anglo-Saxon conception of race and ethnicity is Bede's ecclesiastical history. So the Historia Ecclesiastica Gentis Anglorum. Right. Of the peoples of, of the English. The English. Yes. Right. And those plurals are important. Those plurals are important. Yeah. And that's written in Latin. Right. It gets translated into... Old English, but much later. So okay. it gets translated into English during King Alfred's reign, which is like, you know, a couple hundred years later. Okay. So the, the really important Latin terms then are gens and natio, right. which we've already discussed. And Bede seems to use them in very careful ways, which I'll get into in a minute. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are a number of Old English words that get used in translation of those terms and in other contexts, mm -hmm. to refer to race or a people or a nation. And these include folk. Folk. <laughs> you can't say that word anymore, can well, you? Well, <laughs> it's probably pronounced folk in Old English. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, F-O-L-C, which, you know, means people, nation, race, but can also see, uh, has a secondary sense of meaning army. And that may be oh, an yeah. earlier okay. sort of... Uh, it's like laos in Greek, which uh, means okay. People. People. But also means sort of the host, the, host. the, the yeah, army, the, army. The, the infantry kind right. of thing. Yeah. And then, of course, there's kin, which I already mentioned is related to mm -hmm. gens, gens yep. which in addition to meaning kin, kind, tribe, people, mm -hmm. can in a technical grammatical sense refer to the gender of nouns. Which I suppose isn't surprising when gender yeah. clearly comes from comes the same from root same as root. well. Yeah. Yep. Meaning simply type. Type. Not originally. Another possible word to use in this sense is leoda, which is the plural of leod. Leod means just sort of person, man. Okay. So in the plural, leoda can mean not just people, but sort of group of people. Right, peoples. A people. A people, yeah. A people. 
it makes it into middle English and, you know, barely modern English, I suppose. <laughs> lead. I guess that's how it must be pronounced. Lead or let. Yeah, it must be pronounced lead. L-E-D-E. Note to listeners, Mark's conception of modern English is anything <laughs> post Chaucer. So take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> This word Leoda goes back to a root Leod, Leod, which means to mount up, to grow. So again, it's this kind of similar sense. Yeah, yeah. A similar idea that also gives us the word, uh, it comes into to Latin mm -hmm. and gives us Liber. Liber meaning free. Liber, okay. Though the sense development as to how that happened is somewhat unclear, but it seems to be on phonological grounds pretty solid that that is where it comes, is where from. It comes from. So how you get from to grow to, to meaning free, free is somewhat obscure, but it, giving <laughs> us words like liberal and libertine, liberty, whatever. Also, there is the word strind, the modern word strind, or the, the Anglo-Saxon word strind. <laughs> modern word strind? The, well, There's the, no such thing I as a modern, modern word strind, strind mister. <laughs> it, it, I guess, just barely makes it into, uh, again, modern English. <laughs> Though a related word from the same root does make it into modern English, strain. Right. So strain as in a... A, a, a lineage. A lineage. Yeah, yeah. So a particular strain of fruit flies is yeah. used in this experiment. Or And so this Old English word strind or modern English word strain can be traced back to a Proto-Indo-European root ster, which uh, means to spread. Okay. And again, has lots of other not terribly relevant Deri derivatives. derivatives yeah. But strained certainly is hmm. to our understanding of right. what, you know, the idea of lineage and, yeah, and that makes sense. heritage and so forth. And a final word, theod, from which Tolkien fans among you may right. know theoden. theoden right. So a theoden is the leader of a theod. Okay. So a theod is a people, a nation, however you want to understand that. And right. a theoden is... The so basically, leader. he was king, king. He was king, king. Yeah, his name was king, basically. Yeah. yeah. So theod again, it has the basic sense of people, tribe, nation, race, but it can also refer specifically to homeland, place. Yeah, yeah your patria. And it seems to be used to also translate, and this this comes back to ethne, ethnos, the mm -hmm. Greek, to translate the Hebrew goy or goyim, gentiles. Oh, right. Well. <laughs> Yeah, ethnos is definitely used to mean that in the, the New Testament. The New Testament, yeah. Greek, yeah. I imagine Gentiles is the word we're talking about here, because it gets from gens. Yes. Because your nomen gentilicum is the the name that proves what gens you're from. Yep. So that root gives us, that gens root, mm -hmm. uh, gives us not only Gentile, but gentle as in a Gentleman. You know, of a yeah. gentle birth or a gentleman or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, genteel. Right. Yeah. So all of those, all that, that group of words. To do refer with to your, birth, your birth. Your birth, your status. Your status. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that's really what that gens, that clan is so important. It's about your status, how you fit into your community, mm -hmm. where you are, mm -hmm. what your place in that community is, what your class is, what your roots are. Yeah. And I think that's an important point to, to keep in mind in terms of understanding what this term means, like a term like gentle in the later Middle Ages. Right. So it, it we don't find this particularly in Old English, mm -hmm. but in the in Middle English, mm -hmm. gentle in Chaucer mm -hmm. refers to division in terms of birth, but is not a racial one, right? Yeah, uh, it's sort of what your um, socioeconomic class is. Class is, yeah. So it's more of a class... Yeah, term. I mean, it, it's birth and you can't just move, you can't just make a bunch of money and then move up, mm -hmm. but you could make a bunch of money and then in a couple of generations, your kids could have moved yeah. up because it's about being ennobled and given land and moving into a landowning class and then yeah. you're suddenly a gentle birth. Yeah. Yeah. This was being challenged at the time, uh, in, in Chaucer's time with the Peasants' Revolt and so forth, similar movements. Right. Um, you know, the, the slogan that went around at the time was, when Adam delved and Eve span, who then was the gentleman? Right. Right. Delved, meaning dig. Dig. And span, yeah. being the past tense of spinning. Spin. 
So <laughs> there's a lot of yeah. <laughs> unpacking there unpacking to go on, but yeah, the, who, who could possibly be of a gentle, gentle class? Class, yeah. When everybody was a worker, yeah, and everyone came from the same two people, people right? So how could you divide on the basis of birth? Yeah. Mm-hmm. One last word that is not a general word for race or ethnicity, um, but is worth bringing up at this point is that the Anglo-Saxons referred to the Britons, the Celtic people who lived in Britain, Mm -hmm. not by their own ethnonym. Is that the right word I'm looking for? Sure. Let's call it the right word. (laughs) But by an Anglo-Saxon word, an Old English word, Mm -hmm. um, Welch, from which we get Welsh. Right. Which to this day, the Welsh do not call themselves Welsh. Because it means... It means foreigner. Right. And with undertones of servile or slavey. Right. So the distinction between a foreigner and a slave was simply that a foreigner was someone you hadn't enslaved yet. (laughs) But who is (laughs) liable to that? You couldn't enslave one another. Mm -hmm. Most groups had rules, either actual or understood, against enslaving members of their own group. And right. so the yeah. people who were liable to slavery were those who were foreign to the group. Right. So, yeah. So, I mean, mm-hmm. properly, the Welsh should be known as the Cymru. Assuming I'm pronouncing that anywhere near correct. Cymru? 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 None going to try. The point being, right. if we're going by their own name for themselves. If we're going by their own name for themselves, mm-hmm. which is their the name for Welsh in the Welsh language. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, as I was saying, the main reference here that casts a shadow over all of Anglo-Saxon conception of race and ethnicity mm-hmm. is the ethnogenesis, how the, the, the Anglo-Saxon people come to become a people living in the place that they're living. Right. Because they have a historical migration story. Right. The interesting thing about the the origin story for the Anglo-Saxons is, of course, it occurs in a historical period with historical records not only internally, but actually mostly externally. Yeah. So unlike the Romans and Greeks, who we only have mythical stories, Mm -hmm. maybe or maybe not bolstered by archaeology, here we have written histories from surrounding areas, and yet we also have the sort of mythical history within it. Yeah. And so this is the the really sort of defining kind of story for understanding race and ethnicity and nationhood in Anglo-Saxon England. And I should point out that I did a video, a collaborative video with Jabsy, and we'll put a link to that in the show notes, on the Anglo-Saxon foundation. Mm -hmm. And in spite of what you may have heard of, or maybe proving what you may have heard of YouTube comments, if you are brave enough to look through those comments, you will see there, you know, it has been kind of co-opted in terms of a discussion of racial categories and... Mm-hmm. All about racial purity and yeah. whether people in English are really Germanic or really Norman or what that means or whether there are... Uh, yeah, it's it's really a toxic soup of horror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I speak to only the ones that we sort of tagged topics we were interested in. Yeah. And I've ignored most of them. Mm-hmm. But yeah. <laughs> but it is a good video. I'm proud of it. And um, you should have a look at it. It gives a lot of the background for what I'm kind of going to go into now. Mm-hmm. So this is the argument in particular from one scholar that I've been reading on this issue who's kind of the expert in this area, Stephen J. Harris, and he's written a book and some mm-hmm. articles on on these subjects. Right. And let me just pause to say, I'm going to put a bunch of links in our show notes and go to the website to see them because I also relied on a number of articles and a couple of larger works and a bunch of blog posts as well, which I will post. So right. there's a lot of resources here. Yeah. Well, he argues that the Anglo-Saxon sense of nationhood comes from both religious and and ethnic identity, and that the two are crucially intermixed, that you can't really understand. It's not just a purely ethnic conception, but a very careful blending of religious affiliation Mm -hmm. and ethnic affiliation. And this was important Mm -hmm. because the the Germanic peoples, for instance, sacked Rome. Right. The Germanic peoples, the Vikings, were attacking the Anglo-Saxons. Right. And so if it's sort of problematic to create a category just purely on the basis of ethnic descent. 
because they are not a monolithic group. No. And they fight within one another. Mm. They fight each other. They have different, some of them are Christian, some of them are not. Some of them are, yeah, they're moving around. They have different relations to other groups. So for Bede, in order to be a Gens or whatever word you want to use, mm -hmm. to, in order to be that group, you have to have both the shared ethnic background, and I'll get, I'll sort of fine tune that in a minute. Okay. Um, and the the religious, you you have to be Christian, and right. he points out the the use of the term Christendom, right, to refer to a group of people, and that was that for for Harris, that's sort of the key term, right, is Christendom, a group of people with a shared heritage and a shared religion. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, as I say, the Anglo-Saxon period is, you know, several hundred years. There's change over that time. Right. And so we can see, you know, what Bede understands by these terms is maybe slightly different from what a later writer or group of writer, translator, mm -hmm. um, during King Alfred's reign. King Alfred himself translated some works, but he also had works translated for him by his, his group, his little clique <laughs> yeah. of scholars. His tame scholars, yes. Yes. <laughs> and so for for Alfred, a Christian Angle right. and a Christian Saxon yes. share an ethnic identity. Right. In spite of the fact that they would be talked about as different tribes early on. And maybe of different what we might call dialects, but yes. he might have called languages. Yeah. Right. But they become a unified group because, because they of are the religion. Both Christian. Yeah. There's also a complicated, and I'm not going to get into this, but there's a complicated issue of who the third group is, the Angles, the Saxons, and, and the, the Jutes. <laughs> um, in some, in, in English contexts, they're usually referred to as Jutes, I think. But in other contexts, the word could refer to Jutes. It's, I think it's Geta. Does it refer to G Jutes or Goths? Right. And so there's this complicated argument about the Goths being the sort of the basic stock from which all Germanic groups came from. Right. Okay. Yeah. But that's kind of too complicated an argument, <laughs> I think, for us to understand now. But the interesting thing is, not only do we see this this kind of blending of ethnic and religious going on in Bede's sort of more learned mm -hmm. composition... But we also have the evidence of the genealogies. So there's, there's a whole bunch of genealogies that, that are preserved mm -hmm. um, that trace ancestry back. And they will, I mean, since they largely come from literate times, mm -hmm. they not only trace their ancestry back to Woden or Odin, right. who they take not as a god, I guess, but as a sort of tribal founder or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's kind of a euhemeristic approach euhemeristic to him, approach. yeah. 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 But will also work it into Christian genealogy. Mm -hmm. So trying to get themselves all the way into back the Bible. to Adam. Yeah, yeah. You got to get yourself into the Bible. Yeah. And so again, it's that blending of the religious, religious and, and the the sort of tribal or whatever blood. Blood to get back to our yeah. cocktails. <laughs> and so speaking of of the sort of tricky business about having Germanic, you know, heathens attacking Rome and so forth. Yes. So there's there's a work by Erosius, mm -hmm. which is uh, Seven Books of History Against the Pagans or something. I'm not <laughs> That's getting the title like exactly yeah. right. But basically, it's, it's a history of the biblical peoples, including, you know, the Roman, pre-Christian pre Romans and so forth. Right. And it when it tells the story of Alaric the Goth, Mm -hmm. um, sacking Rome, mm -hmm. it paints him in a very positive light. He's sort of the scourge of God. He Because of the degenerate Romans. Yeah. Right. And that's rather the, the Anglo-Saxon version of the original Rosius. So the original yeah. Rosius, he's, he's a barbarian. He's sacking Rome. But when, the, the Anglo when the Anglo-Saxons Anglo -Saxons translate it, translate it hmm. uh, he is the, the text is Germanicized, mm -hmm. and he is turned into a hero figure right. who 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 invades and sacks Rome, but does so without really killing anyone <laughs> and doing nice deeds along the way and going of really his own saving Rome, Rome from itself. Yes, punishing it by light punish some kind by of like soft punishment, <laughs> tapping it on the yes, head and yes. saying, "Now, now, don't do it this way." Exactly. So that's one story to, to, to think about in terms of how we understand this. Right. That's a conception of, conception again. Of, of what race means. Yeah. Because if Harris is right, the Goths were seen as, Alaric's group mm -hmm. was seen as the, the sort of source from which all Germanic peoples came. Right. And we're not, again, talking about no actual genetics or anything, which is a whole other topic that I'm not going to get yeah, into. Yeah, yeah. But 
perceptions. Yeah. Yeah. The other story that I want to to raise is the story of Pope Gregory <laughs> coming across in the slave market. And you can ask why he was wandering, wandering the slave, the slave market. market well, but that's buying slaves. Buying I mean, slaves, I guess it's slavery has not been it's outlawed not been by yeah. at that point. And you're talking fourth century, right? Fifth century, sixth century, say. Sure. <laughs> but the point the point is, that slavery has not been outlawed yes. in the Christian yeah. world. In any case, he sees in the market two boys that are described as being very beautiful, mm -hmm. and he's very taken by them, and he says, where do these boys come from? Who are they? And he is told uh, they are from the Anglii. Yeah. The Angles. They are Anglii. Yeah. They are the Angles as in the Anglo-Saxons. Mm -hmm. But not the Saxons bits, just the Angles. Just the Angle <laughs> bits. So they come from the north of England, mm -hmm. and the, specifically the, the kingdom of Deira. Okay. Oh, yeah, because that comes up in the later yeah. horrible punny makes. Um, horrible punny makes. It's a, the story is basically a story of a bunch of puns. Yes. That's all it is, really. And so basically, <laughs> Gregory says, well, they must be saved. Or, or First of all, he asks, are they Christian? Mm -hmm. And he's told, no, they're not Christian. And he says, you know, that's too bad. They should be saved. Such beautiful people... The, the inner beauty should accord, should be in balance with the outer beauty. If they are so outwardly beautiful, they should be, should saved, be saved, so they are also innerly inwardly beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's on that on that moment that he decides to send a you know, missionary into Anglo-Saxon England to convert them to the true faith. Mm -hmm. And yes, he does make a bunch of puns. About uh, how they angly, angly not No, they're angly. angels. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, because they're so beautiful as angels, and they come f um, from day era, from day era, from wrath. Yes. So they should be saved from wrath. And he's told that they're the king of this land is called Allah, and he says, "Alleluia." <laughs> which one was it? You? Which video was it? You told these stories. Uh, that was in what is the earliest English word? Yeah, such bad jokes. <laughs> such bad jokes. So. It's interesting that in the Old English version of this story, the translator completely avoids any racial designation of the slavers. The people who have, yeah. are selling the kids. Or are selling the, the kids. boys. Yeah. It's sort of in the Latin, it's sort of vaguely, they're from Britain. Mm -hmm. How do you translate that? You may have to make a specific decision about their Their ethnicity, tribe or their for. ethnicity, yeah. yeah, yeah. Are they from Britain? Does that mean they're... Britanni, but that would mean that they were Celtic, Celtic and they surely aren't. And... Or are they Anglo-Saxon? Yeah. Who knows? So it very carefully just leaves that out. Right, right. So they're very clearly thinking about these issues mm -hmm. of, you know, what it means to be of one group or another. Mm -hmm. And how you distinguish those groups, especially when then you're putting them in conjunction with other groups like Romans yeah. or Christians or, you know, how those shift depending on what the context is. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in case anyone, you know, decides that this idea that he's taken by the beauty of them because they are fair-haired... Little white boys? Little white boys. Mm -hmm. um, Let's be straightforward yeah. here. The term that is used in, in the Latin is venustus, mm. which is just a term that means beautiful. Charming. Charming. With the qualities of Venus. Yeah. Normally, in the terms in the Latin I know, it means sexually attractive. Right. Which later, during the Reformation, uh, Protestants made use of this example to say, oh, popes are just... A bunch know, of lecherous... Lecherous... Uh, sods. Sodom, sodomites. But it's translated as fair. Fair. Meaning beautiful. Meaning beautiful. The, ter the word fair didn't have the sense of pale until after the Anglo-Saxon period. So it just, it really just meant beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're described as candidatus, shining white right. in the Latin. This is translated as white. Mm -hmm. But again, it seems to be symbolic whenever those words are used, either, either the Latin candidatus or the, um, the Old English white, in this kind of a context, it usually means spiritual beauty. Purity. Sp purity, mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't think we should read too much into racial characteristics. Or skin color. Is skin color, you, yeah, yeah. yeah. Specifically, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, candidatus is a word that means, yes, it can mean white, but it also means beautiful. It's a valorized term. Valorized in term, the, okay. In Roman, shall we say, again, erotic terminology. Right, You know, yeah. and, and, and saying it's erotic does not mean that I, like the Protestants, think the pro pope is just being lech. Um, 
a lot of erotic terminology is repurposed as spiritual terminology. Right. That's actually a standard practice yeah. of um, it was a standard practice of the Gospels. To we have that in the the Psalms. Mm -hmm. We have that in the Song of Solomon. Like right. repurposing erotic terminology as faith based or uh, spiritual terminology is right. very. It's a common move. So there's a larger pattern going on there. Right. Yeah. So getting back to Harris's argument, basically what he's saying is that to make a gens, you have to have three things. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a myth of common descent. Right. You, yes. So an ancestor, that, going back to a mythical ancestor mythical that ancestor you all or, claim. Or, right? you know, foundation story or whatever. Right. You've got to have a collective name. Okay. That you all claim. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a specific territory. So place is is vitally right. important for the concept of gens. So there has to be a geography mm -hmm. associated with you. And he points out that the way that gens and natio are used carefully distinguish that place issue. Mm -hmm. So you can have a gens who moves to another area and they become a natio if they're living amongst other people. Okay, no because they no gens. longer have their their space their, that was theirs. Their patria or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And they can only become agains again if they get that sense of a homeland. They now take over this place mm -hmm. as a new homeland? Yeah. And he, furthermore, he makes the point that the angles, the continental angles, before they go to England, when they go to England, they remain agains. Because the entire people left Angel. The, the story, right. supposedly... Is that they're is, flooded out or it whatever. Was the, the air region was completely flooded and it was a complete migration of the people. It was left empty. Yeah. Whereas the other groups, the, the Saxons and the Jutes... Only parts of them. Just migrated. parts of the community left and settled, made a new settlement in Britain. And right. so they then... Are not lose their genship, uh, <laughs> but presumably regain it at some point when we talk about the gens anglorum, you know, when they become a unified people after conversion. Right. Because then somehow that new religious identity allows them a larger yeah. identity. And by then they also, of course, have the place. They've now taken over a new the, place. England is a, you know, Anglon mm -hmm. is a place. Hmm. There's also an importance of language. Yes. To defining. Yes. Uh, yeah, language all the way through is always important. Mm -hmm. You can't be a group if you don't have a common language, but common language is not enough to make you a group. Yeah. So, I mean, there's lots more I could touch on, but... Uh, yeah, I know. I mean, know, we, we've talked... talked... About, I could talk more about how these terms evolve in King Alfred's period and then later towards, you know, after um, Viking settlement and... Yeah. Um, we've already talked... Well, more than enough. Yes. And and I too. I mean, th these are highly complicated topics and they differ between texts and they differ between periods and they differ between places and they differ between genres. And, and these are not simple questions. I think what I wanted to do, the most important thing I wanted to do was simply to say these categories are not obvious there is nothing obvious about how we break people up into groups. There just isn't. Whether it's religion, whether it's varieties of religion, whether it's language, whether it's location, whether it's mythical heritage, whether it's physical characteristics, whether it's ways you pronounce the language, not just the language itself. These things are all important. And also all unimportant, mm -hmm. depending on who you are, when you are. These things shift. They change. They are just, there's nothing objective or natural, <laughs> essentially, right. about any of them. They have all been constructed because of contingent circumstances, because of the things that matter at any given place, at any given time, to any given group. Right. And the ways you divide up those outside of you from those inside of you, the ways you divide up those who are inside, they're all a continually shifting set of criteria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really the thing that I think is most important to take away from all of this. And nothing of what we've talked about maps perfectly onto modern conceptions of race. That's the other thing. Right. They're also not 
totally different. We're not trying to say the modern conception is just came ex nihilo, like came mm -hmm. out of nowhere. Of course, it's influenced by all of these thoughts, but it's not the same as the Roman conception of race or the Greek conception of race or the Anglo-Saxon conception of race. And I think that's the key. And it's that background that we want to have in mind when we turn to how have people used these periods when we're constructing our modern conceptions mm -hmm. and in the ongoing argument right now about what race means or doesn't mean we can say as much as we want that race is a cultural construction it doesn't to say there's no biological basis for race is not to say race is unimportant mm -hmm. as long as people think in terms of race race is massively important mm -hmm. because everybody's experience of the world is filtered through that but that was true when you were Roman about Gens or Natio or whether you were a Roman citizen or not. Your entire life was filtered through which group you were part of. Right. All right. Enough? Enough. <laughs> More than enough. If you've stuck with us all this way, thank you. And we will be back. I think the next episode is going to be much more lighthearted. Yes, definitely. Some Halloween stuff Halloween may be discussed. Stuff. Yes. So we'll be back with Halloween conversations but we will return to this topic in another few episodes yeah and specifically then we'll be talking about as we said how this is co-opted or warped. referenced warped in the in the modern world with issues like white supremacy mm -hmm. and and how 18th and 19th century concepts of race have been projected into the past yeah in ways that are problematic <laughs> <laughs> to put it mildly <laughs> so i'm sure that will be fun too <laughs> <laughs> all right well on that note good night good night for more information on this podcast check out our website www.alliterative.net where you can find links to the videos blog posts sources and credits and all our contact info and please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.